A very good morning, ladies and gentlemen, members of Shalom Baptist Church. It's a joy once again to be able to bring you God's Word this morning. If you will, turn your Bibles with me to the book of Hebrews in chapter 11 and verse 6. The book of Hebrews in chapter 11 and verse 6, and the scripture reads, But without faith it is impossible to please him, for he that cometh to God must believe that he is, and that he is a rewarder of them that diligently seek him. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, Most High God, we thank you for the opportunity once again to be able to hear thy word. Be with me, Lord, as I bring forth thy word to thy people. And Lord, I pray that the words that uh, that, that are brought forth will be a blessing to the hearers, that the, that the things that they hear, they will also practice in their lives. We commit this time into your hands. In Jesus' name, amen. The title for this morning's message is Judging God. Judging God. Now, the title must seem to many people like a mistake. Normally when we think of God, we think of him as a judge, and that he is. He is the only true and righteous judge. And uh, how can we puny mortals judge God? And that's the first question that would come to mind. But what we fail to remember is that every single day, we make judgment calls. We make judgment calls of our situation, we make judgment calls on others and we make judgment calls on God and what we think He's doing in our lives. We all have opinions and judgments on every single thing that happens and they're not always right, but we have them nonetheless. A.W. Tozer said, What comes into our minds when we think about God is the most important thing about us. What a true statement. What comes into our minds when we think about God is the most important thing about us. In the book of Hebrews in chapter 11 and verse 13 and verse 14, the book of Hebrews in chapter 11 and verse 13 and verse 14, the scripture reads, These all died in faith, not having received the promises, but having seen them afar off, and were persuaded of them, and embraced them, and confessed that they were strangers and pilgrims on the earth. For they that say such things declare plainly that they seek a country. The 11th chapter of the book of Hebrews is not new to most of us. It is known as the Bible's Hall of Faith. In it we find the names that we uh, expect to find, names that are, uh, uh, you know, that we see all through the Bible. We see Abraham, we see uh, Noah, and of course we see people even that we don't quite, we didn't quite expect, like Samson. And the big issue here is not really their faith, although the Bible tells us that these great men uh, died in their faith. They died, uh, you know, while still holding on to their faith. The big issue when studying the book of Hebrews is not so much uh, their faith, but uh, uh, the fact that they, they judge God faithful. They judge God faithful. They judge God to be a promise keeper. The wicked people in the Bible had lots of faith. And sometimes we think of, you know, godly people and, and godly folks, and we think, wow, they must be, you know, they must have great faith. But what we fail to realize is that even the wicked have faith. It's not that the wicked don't have faith. In fact, sometimes I feel we preach so much about faith, but it's actually impossible for anyone in this world to live without faith. You know, you have people who, uh, you know, mail letters having faith in the postal service. You have people that take pills having faith in their doctors. You know, right now you're watching this video from home and uh, you have faith in the structural integrity of your home or wherever it is you're at. And all of us go through life uh, with faith. So faith is not the main issue. It's who our faith is on. And the wonderful thing, the amazing thing about uh, people like Abraham, about these men that are described in Hebrews chapter 11, is not that they had great faith, but it's who they had great faith in. You see, these men had certain opinions about God. They made certain judgment calls about who God was. Uh, and the, the, the wicked people of their time also did. Uh, make judgment calls on who God was. They made judgment calls on why they ought to do what they uh, ought to have done, what they did, and so on. 
And, uh, you know, we are the same way. At every junction in our life, we make judgment calls. We decide, based on the evidence before us, whether to place our trust in one thing or another. Today, we are going to see how the only way to live a life of biblical faith is to judge him faithful. We're going to look at three things this morning. Number one, judging him present in the unknown. Judging him present in the unknown. Our opinions of God matter every step of the way. In fact, every day when we get up, when we encounter situations, what we think of God, what we know of God is one of the most pivotal things in life. And uh, one of the things we need to judge God is, we, we need to, uh, uh, to judge, is that we need to judge him present. We need to judge God to be present in the unknown. You know, from an old mariner's chart, they call it Carta Marina, drawn in 1525, uh, there's this chart that's displayed in the British Museum, and it outlines the North American coastline. And of course, the cartographer made some interesting notations about the places that, that hadn't yet been explored. So in those places, he said, well, giants are there. And he said, here be dragons, and here be scorpions, and so on. And eventually, the map came into the possession of Sir John Franklin, a British explorer in the early 1800s. And he scratched that out, and he wrote these words across the map. Here is God. You know, so often we have these terrains in our life. We have the future that is unknown. We have areas that we fear to, to venture into because they are unknown. And, uh, you know, we start imagining the worst. You know, it's just like a child in the in the in, in a dark room. You know, they they imagine the monsters under their bed. They imagine, uh, you know, ghosts in every corner. And I, I know very few children that aren't afraid of the dark. Uh, but kids have this vivid imagination because where there is the unknown, there is always uh, some sort of fear. In Hebrews chapter 11 and verse 8, the scripture reads, By faith Abraham, when he was called to go out into a place which he should after receive for an inheritance, obeyed. And he went out, not knowing whither he went. You know, one of the things we don't do well with uh, as human beings really is the unknown. Uh, and that's quite understandable. Where there is un the unknown, there is the risk that what we discover is uh, going to be something we don't like. One of the biggest reasons we don't live a life that is pleasing to God is that we often fail to judge Him faithful in the unknown. You know, we often have two cards in front of us, face down. Behind one of them is what we are used to, what we know, uh, what we are accustomed to. And behind the other card is the unknown. It's the future we haven't yet seen. And uh, you have to understand that Abraham had an extremely comfortable life in the land of Or. And when we talk about the unknown, one of the characters we want to zoom in on is the character of Abraham. Uh, you have to understand that Abraham lived in the land of Or, and it's very easy sometimes when we read the Bible to look at these characters and say, all right, you know, he left or we've heard the story of uh, a million times and oh, he left the land of war and he, he, he obeyed God and he, uh, you know, he, 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 he traversed the whole piece of land that God said he would give to him and so on. But uh, we have to sometimes pause and look at these occurrences uh, as they would have occurred in the life of Abraham, which means we've got to look at the situation he was in, uh, the circumstances he was in, and uh, we want to see that, uh, you know, uh, it's sometimes easy to misinterpret this you know some people think of abraham as always living in a tent and you know he's always moving and therefore it's no big deal but uh you know the land of ur was actually a very technologically advanced and wealthy civilization uh, it was an urban civilization of a highly evolved types uh, it's artists capable of uh, uh, capable at times of very vivid realism 
followed for the most part standards and conventions whose excellence had been approved by many generations working before them. Its craftsmen and metal possessed the knowledge of uh, metallurgy and a technical skill which few ancient peoples have ever rivaled, and which it must have taken long years to perfect. Its merchants carried a far-flung trade, its agriculture prospered, its armed forces were well organized, and men practiced freely the art of writing. Now, this is a description of the land uh, of Ur. In the PowerPoint slide, you probably see a picture of what the land of Ur uh, would have looked like at that time. Uh, you know, sometimes we think of where Abraham was and we think, well, it mustn't have been that comfortable anyways. It's no big deal. You know, in one of the legal buildings, they found copies of the sentences carefully stacked exactly as they are in the administrative offices of modern law courts. And uh, we find that Ur of the Chaldees was a powerful, uh, prosperous, colorful, and busy capital city in the beginning of the second millennium BC. So we, we have to understand that when God called Abraham to leave that known place, that comfort zone, uh, he was being asked to leave a place that was highly civilized, highly uh, you know, uh, advance. You know, if I were to tell you today to leave your home, to leave Singapore, uh, to leave wherever you are, where you have the, the creature comforts of day-to-day -day life, and I say, I want to leave your home, I want you to leave everything you have behind, and I want you to go uh, to a certain place. I mean, uh, you know, it's a lot easier to apply it to Abraham than it is uh, to ourselves. Uh, Abraham wasn't living in some barren wasteland. In fact, if you look at the, the, the land of Ur, the, ar the archaeology behind the land, uh, we find that he was living in a prosperous city. The average home had two floors with wooden bed frames and even uh, drainage systems. And if you look at the picture on the PowerPoint slide, that's a, a sort of a, a, a dissection, a diagram of uh, what the houses would have looked like in Abraham's day. I mean, uh, you know, Abraham had must have had quite a comfortable and a, a life that was pretty settled. And to ask a man like that in a, in a city like that to just pack up and go is not something that, uh, you know, anyone would take lightly. Now, like I said, most of us would shudder at the thought of leaving a place we're so comfortable in. Most of us would shudder at the thought of, of uh, leaving what we know and what we have for the unknown. Uh, but Abraham uh, did just that. You know, you know, just imagine receiving a call from God today and God comes up to you and God says, you know what, I want you to leave where you are and I want you to go to this place, but I'm not gonna tell you where you're gonna go. I'm not gonna show you a map of where I want you to go. Just stand up and move in this direction and you'll see. I mean, it's hard enough to leave everything uh, for an unknown, uh, for you know, uh, to, to go somewhere else, but it's another thing to leave everything and not know where you're going. He told Abraham to take the first step. The rest of the steps were revealed as time went on. Humanly speaking, there was great risk involved. You know, I can only imagine Abraham trying to explain this to some of the, the neighbors and the citizens of uh, uh, Ur that were there, trying to explain to them that he had this call and that God had called him to leave. And, you know, they'd ask him, Abraham, uh, where did God ask you to go? He said, well, I don't know. He hasn't shown me the map. All I know is that I've got to pack up and I've got to obey. I mean, if they were unbelievers, they would have said, you got to be kidding me. I mean, no one would do that. And so often we find that we are faced with this exact dilemma in our lives. Uh, we, uh, you know, staying within the known and, uh, you know, we want to stay within the known and we have that choice to either obey or disobey without knowing what comes next. Now, this is where judgment comes in. We started this talking about judging God. And this is where judgment comes in. Now, most of us look at both the options and we judge it at face value. Here are the risks involved and here are the pros and cons. And we look at the status quo and we say, well, the known looks a lot brighter. 
you know, it's always easier to pick something we have, we think we have a better clue on uh, than something that we don't. And, you know, he's, I know God wants me to attend church. I know God wants me to spend time with him. But you know what? Uh, I've got this job that's lined up. I know for a fact that they're going to hire me if I just say yes. But I will have to work every Sunday. I will not have time to attend any uh, Bible study sessions. I will not have time to do the work of God. I will not have time to fellowship with God, uh, with the people of God. Uh, but you know something? I have two options. On one hand, I've got the known and I've got the guaranteed job. Now, this job has been given to me, and I, all I need to do is say yes, and I have a steady income. On the other hand, I have the commands of God, and I don't know if I say, if I don't know that if I say no to this job, you know, you know, I don't know if I'm going to get a job tomorrow. I'm, I don't know if I'm going to get a job next week. I don't know when the next job is going to come along. So I've got the known. I've got something that is guaranteed in my eyes. And on the other hand, uh, I've got something that uh, uh, just holds no promise, at least for now. You know, we judge God as being possibly absent from the future. You know, if uh, Abraham had made his decision based on the situation alone, I don't think he would have set one foot out of that land. You know, so often we look at our lives, we look at the things that are going on, and uh, we judge the situation, but fail to judge God. We, we judge the situation, we judge what we know, but we fail to judge uh, whether or not God is going to be present in the future. You see, just as that job, just as much as you think that job is guaranteed, you fail to realize that God is guaranteed in the future, that obedience will be rewarded and that disobedience will be punished. In the book of Hebrews, in chapter 11 and verse 10, the scripture reads, For he looked for a city which hath foundations, whose builder and maker is God. For Abraham, God with the unknown was a better risk than the known without God. All the risk is taken away when we know who holds our hand through the unknown. You see, the main issue is not our judgment of the situation, but our judgment of who God is and whether or not he's able to do what he said he was going to do. In the book of Isaiah in chapter 50 and verse 10 and verse 11, the book of Isaiah in chapter 50 and verse 10 and verse 11, the scripture reads, Who is among you that feareth the Lord? that obeyeth the voice of his servant, that walketh in darkness and hath no light. Let him trust in the name of the Lord and stay upon his God. Behold, all ye that kindle a fire, that compass yourselves about with sparks, walk in the light of your fire and in the sparks that ye have kindled, this shall ye have of mine hand, ye shall lie down in sorrow. You know, sometimes we look at the dark, we look at the light. Now I'm talking about in literal terms, and, you know, the light is always more alluring. But you know something? It is better to walk in the dark and trust in the Lord than to walk in a man-made false light. It is better to walk in the dark and trust in the Lord. So if God tells you, I want, to go, I want you to go into this tunnel that is not lit, it is better to go down that direction of uncertainty in the will of God than to walk in a direction that seems certain that is out of the will of God. You know, so often God keeps us from knowing the, the exact future benefits of our obedience, the exact details, because He wants us to factor in, uh, He wants us to factor Him in as the biggest plus in our decision making. Have you ever wondered why God doesn't give us the details? You know, there, there are so many things that, you know, would become way easier if God just gave in and told us what he plans to do. But so often we find that when God gives us a command to obey, we don't know exactly what lies on the other side of the door. You know, the Bible has tons of commands for us. You know, as young people, for the old, for, for, for the middle age, for fathers, for mothers, for children. Uh, you know, the principles that help us make decisions in, uh, in things that are major and minor. And sometimes you look at the, 
uh, options that are before you and you say, well, I know that God wants me to do this, but I don't know what's on the other side. Are there areas in your life, are there areas, are there areas in our lives where we, you know, aren't obeying because it's just too comfortable where we are? Are there areas we refuse to give up to God because we just are afraid to deal with the uncertainty of what comes after? You know, Abraham was faithful because he judged God present in the unknown. He judged God present. You see, he couldn't see God. But he knew that God was going to be there wherever he was going to go. He didn't need to know, oh, here, here you go, Abraham. Here's a map of, you know, I want you to go up to this land and then up here. He didn't, know, he didn't need to know all that. He just needed to know, well, Lord, if I do that, are you going to be with me? That's good enough for me. He judged God to be present in the future. Folks. Our opinion of God, our opinion, our understanding that God is going to be there in the future is, I know, you know, we take it for granted sometimes. Yes, we know God's there all the time. But when it comes to making a decision, do we judge God present? Do we judge him present? Number one, we want to, we want to judge him present in the future. Number two, judging him faithful in the impossible. You know, waiting is never fun. Yet we find that as human beings, we have to do quite a bit of it. Sarah is a very good example. Sarah was 65 years old when God first promised Abraham a large posterity. From that first promise to when uh, Sarah actually had her child, uh, when she actually gave birth to Isaac, we find about 20 years uh, would have, uh, about th there, was, there was about a 25 year gap. You know, and. Uh, we want to look at Sarah's reactions to these, uh, to to this twenty-five year gap, uh, two judgment calls that she made. You see, again, every day we are making judgment calls when something happens in our life. So we're going to look at two judgment calls. Number one, in the book of Genesis, in chapter ten, uh, chapter eighteen, and verse ten to verse fourteen. The book of Genesis, in chapter eighteen, and verse ten to verse fourteen, the scripture reads, "And he said, I will certainly return unto thee according to the time of life. And lo, Sarah thy wife shall have a son." And Sarah heard it in the tent door which was behind him. Now Abraham and Sarah were old and well stricken in age, and it ceased to be with Sarah after the manner of women. Therefore Sarah laughed within herself, saying, After I am waxed old, shall I have pleasure, my Lord being old also? And the Lord said unto Abraham, Wherefore did Sarah laugh, saying, Shall I of a surety bear a child which am old? Is anything too hard for the Lord? At the time appointed, I will return unto thee according to the time of life, and Sarah shall have a son. You see, in Genesis 18, we see none other than God himself promising once again uh, that Sarah was going to have a son. Now, God could have given her a son at the age of 65. God could have given her a son at the age of 68, 75, 81, but no. Uh, this time he comes and he says, I'm going to come by and give you a son next year now that you're 90. And uh, Sarah heard this and she had to make a judgment call. Her judgment call caused her to laugh at the promise. You see, she was 90 years old. I mean, you can't fault the lady for being logical. You can't fault the lady for being practical. Uh, she was 90 years old and her husband was 100 years old. Uh, and to her, just the thought that, you know, she was going to uh, have a child with Abraham, I mean, laughing seemed to be the only thing to do. But later in the scriptures, we are given an account uh, that shows Sarah's spiritual growth. In the book of Hebrews, in chapter 11 and verse 11, the scripture reads, Through faith also Sarah herself received strength to conceive seed, and was delivered of a child when she was past age, because she judged him faithful who had promised. She judged her situation initially, and she laughed. She judged God's faithfulness, and she received strength to conceive. You know, so often God allows so much time to pass before answering our prayers. And we wonder, Lord, why not just 
answer it right now. Of course, there are many reasons why God doesn't always answer prayer, uh, prayers immediately. Sometimes it's just not the right time. Sometimes God God wants to wants you to, to persist in prayer. Sometimes God has something better for you. Sometimes it's a no. But there are, you know, there are many reasons why God doesn't answer prayers immediately. But sometimes God allows a delay so that you have time to make a judgment call. You know why? He wants us not to judge the situation. He wants us not to judge the time that lapses between his promise and the result. But he wants us to judge him. He wants us to form an opinion of him. He wants us to remind ourselves on who he is rather than on what the situation is. You know, over and over we see in the Bible, uh, you know, the same thing. Uh, so often God allows things to seem impossible before coming in to deliver because he wants us to judge him faithful instead of judging the situation. In the book of Exodus in chapter 14 and verse 1 and verse 2, the scripture reads, And the Lord spake unto Moses, saying, Speak unto the children of Israel, that they turn and encamp before Pihahiroth, between Migdal and the sea, over against Balzephon, before it shall... Uh, it shall before it shall ye encamp by the sea. And in Exodus chapter 14 and verse 8 uh, and verse 9, And the Lord hardened the heart of Pharaoh king of Egypt, and he pursued after the children of Israel, and the children of Israel went out with an high hand. But the Egyptians pursued after them all the horses and chariots of Pharaoh, and his horsemen and his army, and overtook them, and camping by the sea beside Pihahiroth, before Pelzephon. And when Pharaoh drew nigh, the children of Israel lifted up their eyes, and behold, the Egyptians marched after them, and they were sore afraid. And the children of Israel cried out unto the Lord. And they said unto Moses, Because there were no graves in Egypt, hast thou taken us away to die in the wilderness? Wherefore thou hast dealt, with, dealt thus with us to carry us forth out of Egypt. Is not this the word that we did tell thee in Egypt, saying, Let us alone, that we may serve the Egyptians? For it had been better for us to serve the Egyptians than that we should die in the wilderness. And Moses said unto the people, Fear ye not, stand still and see the salvation of the Lord, which he will show to you today. For the, for the Egyptians whom ye have seen today, ye shall see them again no more forever. The Lord shall fight for you, and ye shall hold your peace. You know, again, we see in Scripture uh, judgment calls being made. It's interesting to note that it is God who first puts them in, uh, who first puts them into a seemingly impossible situation. In Exodus chapter fourteen and verse one and verse two, God specifically orders them to gather in a place uh, that is uh, a seeming dead end. A uh, piha he wrote, on one end is the sea, on the other end it's a pursuing army. I mean. God could have chosen so many, uh, you know, different ways to, to deliver the, the, the nation of Israel. He could have given them a better route. He could have, you know, done all these things. But we find that he put them uh, right there where they had no choice but to face a dead end. And then uh, we find that uh, God hardens Pharaoh's heart and causes them to pursue. Why? Why not just give them an alternative route? You know, the more I study these things, the more I realize uh, how much God wanted them to make the right judgment call. You know, it's uh, it would have been very easy for God to say, well, uh, Moses, tell them together by Piha he wrote. And Moses, I want you to tell them that this is what I'm going to do. I'm going to part the Red Sea. I'm going to, uh, you know, drown the Egyptians and I'm going to save you. Moses, tell them what I'm going to do. But for that period of time, from the time they came to the time God did what he did, there was a period of silence. Uh, God did not uh, tell them exactly what he was going to do. And there's a reason why. I believe God did that to test them. And God did that to give them a time uh, to make a judgment call. He wanted them to judge him faithful. You see, the Israelites did make a judgment call, but they judged the situation impossible. They judged that it would have been better for them to serve the Egyptians than to obey God. They judged God 
unfaithful and unable. You know, sometimes we too find ourselves in an impossible situation. Every time we find ourselves in a place where we can either obey or disobey, uh, God seems silent. There is no answer. There is no voice from heaven. And we wonder why. You know, folks, what I found is that between that time and the time God answers, we have an opportunity to make a judgment call. We have an opportunity to look at God and say, Lord, I know that you are faithful. God wants to see who we judge and how we judge. Over and over again, we find the Bible people who judge God amiss. In the earliest book of the Bible, we see uh, the oldest book of the Bible, we see the exclamation of Job. You know, first we see that he judged, he judges God correctly in the book of Job in chapter 1 and verse 21. He said, And naked came I out of my mother's womb, and naked shall I return thither. The Lord gave, and the Lord hath taken away. Blessed be the name of the Lord. He judged God correct. God had all the rights. He got blessed. God can take away. Blessed be the name of the Lord. Job went through some of the greatest calamities a human being can possibly go, go through. I mean, you talk about losing his loved ones, losing his fortune, losing his health. He lost everything a man could possibly lose. And of course, you know, it's very easy to criticize Job, but I think many of us in that situation would probably have fared worse. He went through some of the greatest calamities, but he did not curse God. But there were moments when he misjudged God as, you know, as the misery dragged on as the pain and the itch and the sores festered on his body. Uh, there were moments he misjudged God's intent. In the book of Job in chapter 13 and verse 23 and 24, the scripture reads, How many are my iniquities and sins? Make me to know my transgression and my sin. Wherefore hidest thou thy face and holdest me for thine enemy? You see, Job at this point of time is judging God as treating him as his enemy. His opinion of God is this, God, you are treating me like I'm your enemy. And sometimes we find that just like Job, we are the same way. We go through the trials and difficulties of life. Maybe we lose a job, maybe we lose a loved one, maybe we, we get into a health crisis, maybe things don't seem to be going as uh, great as they used to be. And, uh, we judge God as being indifferent toward us. We judge God as frowning upon us. We judge God as not loving us. You know, we judge God as if God was treating us as the enemy. All of a sudden, we don't judge God as faithful, loving, and forgiving, but we judge God as angry and vindictive. You know, there are many out there who do not believe in God, and uh, they claim they do not believe in God, but their idea, they judged, uh, they've already judged that God, if he were there, was an angry God. They judged that God is a God that is, uh, uh, you know, I've spoken to many atheists over the course of, uh, uh, you know, my life. And what I've found is that many of them, uh, you know, when they start attacking the Bible and attacking the things of God, um, I, I know sometimes they don't intend to do it, of course, but when they start doing that, uh, they often come up with uh, arguments as to why God is cruel and why the God of the Bible is a certain way and, you know, uh, you know to, to try to make reasons up as to why they shouldn't believe in God. But then again here, they misjudge God. They misinterpret the scriptures. They misjudge God. They misjudge who God is. So often we cause ourselves unnecessary distress, not because of the trouble itself, but because of the false view we have of God. You know, sometimes we, we, we go to different extremes. Some people look, as God, look at God as someone who is just looking down, wanting to judge you, wanting to punish you, wanting to chastise you, keeping scores of all the sins you're doing and waiting to bring the rod down to smash you. And they have this view of God. And so every time they think of God, all they feel is misery. And all they feel is, oh man, you know, I can never live up uh, to God. And that's not God's fault. It's how they judge God. You know, we feel miserable because we judge God absent. You know, when you judge God faithful, you can go through the worst periods of, you know, you can go through the worst calamities of life. 
and you will do it with a smile. Because you know that through that time, that, that, that space of time where you're going through those trials and difficulties, God is still faithful. You don't mistake his silence for apathy. You don't mistake his uh, temporary uh, delay for, uh, uh, you know, uh, hatred. In Job chapter 42 and verse 1 and verse 2, the scripture reads, Then Job answered the Lord and said, I know that I know that thou canst do everything, and that no thought can be withholden from thee. You know, of course, we know what happened. There was a discourse between Job and three of his friends and uh, another guy. And eventually, God would come out of a whirlwind, and he would challenge Job, and he would say, you know, and he would he would ask questions of Job that Job wouldn't be able to answer. Where were thou when I, you know, built up the foundation of the world? And at the end of that discourse, Job had only one thing to say, Lord, you can do everything and you know everything. You see, all the false notions he had of God, all the the judgment calls he made of God that was wrong was put right after that. And he can make that statement, I know that thou canst do everything and that no thought can be withholden from thee. When we come to understand, and I mean fully grasp that God knows everything and is able to do everything, then we begin to judge him right. You look at the situation that you have at hand and you ask yourself, can God do everything about this? Yes. Is God able to? Yes. Uh, does he love me? Yes. Uh, does he want the best for me? Yes. And yet he is not doing, he is not relieving me of this problem right now. Why? There must be a reason. And it must be a reason that's good for me. Think about it. You've got a God that can do all things. You've got a God that is all powerful. And at the same time, a God who is all loving. He does not withhold good things from his children. If he withholds something from you for a period of time, there must be a very good reason in your favor. We've got to judge God as present in the future. We've got to judge God as faithful in the impossible. Folks, sometimes we go to God with things and we think, you know, this is possible and that's possible. But when it comes to the impossible things, sometimes we stop praying. The fact of the matter is sometimes when things look impossible, the miracles are the nearest. Never stop praying. And uh, thirdly, we're going to see that uh, we ought to judge him, judging him as a rewarder of obedience. Judging him as a rewarder of obedience. In Hebrews chapter 11 and verse 6, But without faith it is impossible to please him, for he that cometh to God must believe that he is, and that he is a rewarder of them that diligently seek him. Notice that he that cometh to God must not only judge him to be God, with all that comes with it, but he must judge that he is a rewarder of him that diligently seeks him. The Bible says he is a rewarder. It doesn't say he may reward. It says he will reward. In Romans chapter 4 and verse 19 to verse 21, the scripture reads, And being not weak in faith, he considered not his own body now dead, when he was about an hundred years old, neither yet the deadness of Sarah's womb. He staggered not at the promise of God through unbelief, but was strong in faith, giving glory to God and being fully persuaded that what he had promised, he was also able to perform. Abraham staggered not at the promises of God. What a word. Abraham staggered not at the promises of God. He didn't get up on Monday morning trusting that God would reward him for his obedience, and get up on Tuesday morning saying, um, well, uh, one day has already passed. Is God going to reward me? He trusted in the sure reward of the Lord. You know, so often we get weary in well-doing. We get tired of obeying because we don't see the immediate rewards. Now, we use the word trust so often, but so, so often we don't fully understand what trust means. The Bible describes Abraham 
uh, and Sarah and the patriarchs as being pilgrims and sojourners in the land. They, they saw themselves as uh, people who did not belong. They were looking for something better, uh, a city whose maker and builder is God. You see, the thing is this, true trust reframes our, vo our worldview. True trust reframes our worldview. You know, a man once taught a class of mentally impaired teenagers, looking at his students' capabilities rather than his limitations. Uh, you know, this guy, he got them to play chess. So he was teaching a group of students who were, uh, you know, uh, a little, you know, mentally impaired. He got them to play chess. He got them to restore furniture. He got them to repair electrical appliances. And what he was trying to teach them was this. Trust in your abilities. Now, of course, that's not what we believe. We believe you ought to trust in God. But of course, this teacher, he wanted them to, he wanted them to, be t to get so confident that they would be able to trust in their abilities to be independent, to fix things for themselves and so on. And uh, it was from one of these boys that he learned what real faith meant. Sometimes we ask, what is faith? One day, one of his students brought in a broken toaster in one hand. And in the other hand, a loaf of bread. <laughs> so the boy had in one hand a broken toaster and he trusted in his ability to fix that toaster so much that he brought bread along because he knew that afterward he could toast some bread. And that basically is what true trust is. You know, when you trust God, not only do you trust him, you bring that bread along with you because you know it's going to get toasted. You know, folks, if we truly believe without staggering that the rewards will come, we too will not just walk with the toaster. We will be doing way more soul winning. We will be doing way more. Sometimes we stop. You know why? Because we get rejected, because people say no, because people uh, don't seem to be uh, responding to our presentation of the gospel. But when you remember that God is a God that rewards, you win souls every day. You tell, you preach the gospel to your colleagues every day. You go out to the people that need to hear the word of God and you share with them the word of God, even if you do not see the immediate reward, because God is a rewarder of them that diligently seek him. Folks, not one single act done for the Lord will go unrewarded. It may not always be immediate, but it is definitely certain. In the book of Psalms, in chapter 19 and verse 11, the scripture reads, Moreover, by them is thy servant warned, and in keeping of them there is great reward. My friends, God will never cheat you of your reward. It's a sure thing. If only we would judge him a rewarder of obedience, we find that obedience becomes a second nature. Disobedience will no longer be an option. You know, the only sure investment in life is obedience. And the only sure loss is disobedience. Daniel judged God a rewarder of obedience, and the lions could do him no harm. Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, Judge God a rewarder of obedience, and the furnace could do them no harm. Over and over and over again in the Bible, we find men who judge God faithful, who judge God a rewarder of obedience, who judge God as being present in the future. And their reward was great. And obedience came to them naturally. So often we fail to obey God. We fail to do the things of God because we are judging the situation. We are judging uh, in our own light. And we are afraid to venture into that dark, unknown territory. When what we are supposed to be doing is to look and discard the situation altogether with our eyes toward heaven. And we ought to judge who God is. We ought to form our opinions of God. To this morning, if you do not have concrete opinions, I'm not talking about some intellectual knowledge, but some convictions about who God is, then I pray that this morning you will judge Him faithful. Folks, there is no two ways about it. God is the rewarder of them that diligently seek Him. 
God is faithful even when he seems to be silent. God is faithful even when there is a gap between your, your problem and when whatever time God wants to deliver you from it. God is faithful even when he doesn't disclose all his plans to you. You know, you even when all the things in your life doesn't seem to be going the way you want, God is faithful. God is present and God rewards. Not only were these people like Daniel and Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, not only were they kept from harm, but we know they were thoroughly rewarded. So the question we ought to ask ourselves today is a simple one. What are your opinions of God? Does every trial cause you to doubt his love, presence, and faithfulness uh, and promises? Or are we fully persuaded? The Bible talks of, the, of these men, the, the patriarchs, as being persuaded persuaded and then they embrace the promises you know the bible talks about the word embrace actually to salute the promises and then they confess the promises of god and their faith did not uh, stagger or waver and they died in faith are we going to be fully persuaded that he is god and that he's a rewarder of them that diligently seek him Folks, the most important thing that you can do for yourself is to form the right opinion of who God is. Everything else will come naturally. And for those of you who do not know the Lord Jesus Christ, you, do not, you need to know also that God is holy. You know, a lot of times people have this idea in their minds that because God is love, that he is some sort of celestial Santa Claus. Uh, some sort of grandfather in heaven that would overlook uh, sin. But the Bible says that God is holy and that all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. Uh, you know, the world has a view of God and different people have different views of God, but that's not the point. The most important view is the view that is given to us from the Bible because that's the truth. And the Bible says that God is holy. And because men have sinned, it's appointed unto man wants to die. And after this, the judgment and the wicked shall be turned into hell and all the nations that forget God. But this morning, I want you also to judge God loving because 2,000 years ago, God sent his only begotten son to the world to die for your sins and mine. You know, in religion, we are, we are you know, man works toward going to heaven. Man has to try to be as good as he can. But in Christianity, you cannot. Be good enough to get to heaven because all of us have sinned. We cannot pay the price for our sin. So 2,000 years ago, God sent his only begotten son to die for your sins and mine. And if we accept that payment that he has already paid, we too can be with him. My friends, this morning, let us judge him faithful. Let us judge him a rewarder of, the, of those that are obedient. Let us judge him present in the future. And let us judge him to be the savior of our lives. With every head bowed and every eye closed. Heavenly Father, we thank you for your word. And Lord, this morning we want to form opinions of you. We want to fully understand uh, that there are some things we should not focus on. Uh, we don't focus on the situation, Lord. Uh, we do not focus on how dreary or how good the situation is because Situations can change in a moment, in a, in, in a matter of seconds. But Lord, we know that if we have the right opinion of you, if we judge you correctly, then we will have that confidence to go about in full obedience, knowing that even if the situation changes, that you are a God that will never change, that there are some things about you that are ever never changing, Lord, that you are a just God, a faithful God, a loving God and a God that rewards obedience. I pray that you be with every single person that is hearing this message, that you work in their hearts, Lord, and that you will give them a blessed week to come as they grow uh, in thee and as they attempt to serve thee for your glory. In Jesus' name I pray, amen. Have a wonderful week ahead. God bless.